Welcome to the Wild Tales podcast. I'm Jason Fox, and this series is all about adventure, resilience, and inspirational humans. The podcast is presented by the Book of Man and in partnership with Talisker, a single malt whiskey made by the sea. We're approaching the end of this series of podcasts, but we're ending on a series of highs. None more so than today's episode, where my guest is Vigo Mortensen. Vigo is one of the biggest stars in the world, thanks to films like The Road, A History of Violence, and of course, The Lord of the Rings trilogy. But he's also an author, poet, painter, photographer, musician, and rides a mean horse. He's far from your average actor. I spoke to him about his unconventional childhood, his independent spirit, and his directorial debut, Falling, which looks at issues of mental health and tough guys. In the episode, I asked Vigo one of the questions you send in on Instagram. I'll be sending out a Talisca sea salted caramel gift pack to the one I pick out. Anyway, here we go. I hope you enjoy this episode. Vigo, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very busy person and it is really, really appreciated. Um, I'm a big fan myself, so that's obviously a, a, a massive bonus. Love all the stuff that you've done and do. Uh, but let's start off at the beginning. Can you tell me about um, your early life? What was it like to be you as a kid? And um, I believe you lived in a number of different countries. So how, how was that? Well, I was born in New York City, but as an infant, my dad got a job in South America. First, we went to Venezuela, spent a year there. And then I don't remember that very well. <clears throat> Just some vague memory of mountains in the distance in the city, which would have been Caracas. But then, um, you know, most of my first, the first decade of my life, I lived in Argentina, both in the capital in Buenos Aires and in, and in the country, uh, yeah. some different farms, including way up north in the Chaco region, which is sort of subtropical uh, farms. My dad was, uh, He's Dan- he was Danish and he was raised on a farm in Denmark. And so it, the jobs he got were managing different farms, ranches, you know, chicken farms, cattle farms, crops, different things. He was sort of the manager. You know. Yeah, yeah. And how did, did that obviously that influence your life with regard to being quite outdoors, did it? And, and also were you, were you there yeah. on hand, were you helping out? Yeah, I mean, I learned to ride horses very young and even as a little kid would help sometimes with, you know, gathering cattle and things like that. And I was always, I mean, like my father had been, I, you know, he was raised in the country and so he was very much into fishing and hunting and outdoor stuff, hiking, all that stuff. So he, he taught me those things and, you know, I had early on a, I was comfortable in natural surroundings and I like that. And, and I've always been, you know, everybody's different, but I'm, I'm someone who can, I can spend a week or two weeks without even talking to anybody. And I'm, I'm happy. I get, keep myself busy doing things. And, uh, but that's just not so much. I don't think that has so much to do with my upbringing. It's probably just the way I am. Other people need to be in touch with people and talk with them on a daily basis. I don't necessarily need that uh, kind of, I guess, self-sufficient in the, to a degree. And like, I like, I like being on my own and I was always sort of fantasizing adventures and, you know, walking around, whether it was in the city or in the country, imagining I was on some great exploration or some adventure. And, you know, I mean, most kids do that, but I did that constantly and I am still doing it. (laughs) Do you think, because like, I've, I've had a thing with mental health and stuff like that, and I've always been an outdoorsy person. Do you think that's something that you need as, as your, it is for me, it's, it's how, I, I, how I fixed myself was the outdoors and actually yeah. it wasn't necessarily people, it was, it was my connection with nature. Do you, is that something that you think is quite a powerful thing in yourself? Yeah, I know that I've, I know how good it feels. It doesn't matter where it is in the world when I get outdoors. If I'm out in natural surroundings, doesn't matter what the weather is, everything kind of calms down and I don't, I never feel like a moment is wasted. Whereas I can be in a city or around people and I can feel, I have to fight against thinking, oh, I'm wasting time, life is short, why am I doing this, you know? Yeah. Um, 
standing in lines or listening to stupid conversations or conversations that don't interest me in any in any case for whatever reason and so I kind of resist that because obviously you can learn something from any moment any place any person but my my instinct is to be on my own in the outdoors I really enjoy that or sharing the outdoors with someone I care about yeah, so yeah. It's true I do go there and during the lockdown I certainly missed it I was in a city Fortunately, we had some windows that had some small balconies, which I filled, well, they were already filled with plants. I like trees and plants. I, I tend to, when I walk around, whether it's in the city or in the country, depending on the season, I'll gather, you know, seeds and things and yeah. just to see what they're like, especially trees I don't know much about. I'll figure out how to grow them. And I have, I have lots of different kinds of trees growing on our balconies. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. I've, I'm often asked, well, why don't, how about flowers? I say, well, I like those too. And I do have those. I'll plant them at the base of the trees, but it's full of things. During the lockdown, I spent a lot of time on those balconies, just looking out the window and thinking it'd be nice to get out of here. But while I'm here, I'll do this, you know? And so I uh, yeah. didn't know how long it would last. So I started, I planted tomatoes in the spring, you know, and potato. I had all kinds of vegetables growing. I mean, within reason it was i mean you could no longer the complaint in our household was we can no longer use the balcony in any way to sit outside you know at all you, you filled them with all this all these plants and trees and things and i said well it's nice though isn't it yes yes but it'd be nice to be able to step outside i said well you can go for a walk outside I said well it's not the same anyway i enjoyed that and i enjoyed that it was a rainy even snowy spring and um yeah it's, yeah creating a place with the, i suppose that that it sounds like you're like creating a place where you can be be closer to the, the nature that is so far away because of the lockdown and all the yeah. stuff that's gone on this year you know yeah yeah but i always have liked that i mean and even in, when i'm on a job let's say it's more than a few weeks if it's months you know sometimes movie shoots are that and I'll, whatever the hotel room or the apartment I'm in, um, unless we move around a lot, it just depends you know, what the locations are. But generally, you're sort of in one place for quite a while. And I tend to find, you know, plants locally. And I have them. I fill the room with those too, much to the consternation sometimes of the, of the housekeeping people, whatever. But, you know, yeah, I, I gravitate toward that. I like that. I'd be happy just. Gardening is another thing that doesn't feel like a waste of time ever. No, no. I mean, I live in London, so it's something that's difficult to do, and, and me and my partner try. But yeah, I think sometimes it's good to get out and, and experience it if you can't get too much of it in where you live. True. Yeah. Do you live near a park? Uh, yeah, I live I live south of the Thames, so near a place called Clapham Common, which is always nice to walk around. It's big enough. Not as big as I'd like, but it's big enough. Yeah, that's nice. That's always cool, yeah. Uh, just obviously, falling is is your movie in more ways than one, really. But I noticed in it, it, it I mean, it's built as a personal film, and we see. That, I, I love the flashbacks, you know, and it, and it's not like complicated flashbacks. It's very, you know, it's obvious, obviously. But um, and there's the there's the ones where there's you know John who you play and Willis who Lance plays your father in it. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of time, or there is not a lot of time, but there's time spent hunting out in the outdoors. Is yeah. is it reminiscent of your childhood? Did you use that to focus? To some, to some degree, and and you know, I mean, it's it's a story that has a lot to do with memory, you know, um, which is imperfect and subjective and evolves as time goes on. I think it's more a collection of feelings than it is of facts, even though we think, well, yeah. the present's confusing future we don't know what it is in the past at least we can count on that but in reality you know it's not it's not that reliable it's still worth exploring and that's what i was doing in part in the movie yeah memories of not just willis who's in the early stages of dementia so it adds an extra element to his memories um they're very much his present in a way he doesn't differentiate at times and um and John's, my character's memories, and my sister's, played by well, Sarah, played by Laura Linney. Um, and a lot of those memories, the ones that we share, and the ones that are subjectively, especially Willis's memories, have to do with nature, have to do with different seasons. Yeah. And I was careful shooting all that before the main shoot, even before we had the money to make the movie, really, 
because I knew I'd want a library of these images from different seasons and we'd never have the time to do it. I couldn't sort of, we didn't have the budget to like, I could say, well, I'll wait six months to edit the movie. I'm going to go get these. I, I couldn't. So, yeah. and it was a good way to get ready for the movie and get in sync with the cinematographer, Marcel, um, and the production designer to find the locations, film there, spring, summer, autumn. And um, yeah, that's important. The hunting stuff. I mean, the movie's a fiction. It's a fictional family. Yeah. My dad was Danish. He wasn't American. I don't have any sisters, but um, I mean, I have some stepsisters, but I didn't grow up with them. And uh, there is, I mean, the, one of the only things, sequences that are taken literally from my own childhood is the duck hunting sequence, which is spread out. It's used as a way of introducing the family, the dynamic between the parents and also between the father and the son and the and the mother and the son, it sort of starts you off and it's spread out over the first third of the movie. And then there's one final scene, as, as you know, uh, towards the end that sort of concludes the duck eating, the duck, the adventure of the duck, the story of the duck. And that did happen. I mean, I was, it wasn't in North America. It was actually in Argentina and it was winter. It was cold. Uh, I was four years old. He did say, you want to shoot? which I was really happy about. Now I look back and I go, that's pretty young to be doing that. And, um, and I did get off a lucky shot. It was dark. It was almost dark. And um, he just thought I'd like to just shoot because he heard some ducks coming last, last, last try, but he never expected me to shoot the duck. Um, and I did jump in the freezing water, which was a problem. And we had a long way to walk. And, <laughs> and we actually, I remember we stopped, there was some hut, walking across these marshes on the way back to the car and I was really freezing cold and I wouldn't let go of this duck and so we came to this hut basically where this man lived I think he was a sheep herder and he had built a fire outside and he sort of stoked that up it was like a bonfire almost and they took my clothes off and hung them on sticks that they stuck on the ground and I was standing naked in front of the fire kind of what you see the boy in the, in the movie drying off and drying off my duck and so forth and, and we did get home quite late my mother was really worried and and she was you know the, it was kind of the way it happened and I insisted on bathing with it which she was kind of not in a, approving of but my dad took my side <laughs> you know, my side when I wanted to dry it off and sleep with it and she just thought it was ridiculous and and um, but she let it happen and and then I did wake up in the morning and it was gone and I did have to adapt the only difference I guess was the, the big difference was that I was much angrier than the boy in the movie I mean I stayed angrier longer when I realized that my duck had been taken and was being plucked you know and you I but I did eventually she did finally just say look you if you want to be part of this you can but this is what's happening just deal with it you know and so i did it was a, it was a good i mean yeah it's an interesting thing and i mean it's made even more interesting by the fact it's real that that's actually something that you went through it was <laughs> I, I, admittedly um young john took it a little bit easier because he was allowed to get involved in the plucking he just seemed to say yeah, yeah. yeah i mean i eventually calmed down too and i did pluck it for help <laughs> um she obviously did most of it and um and I do remember watching it being cooked and the, the whole thing was interesting the, the whole and the eating of it. And uh, my did, it wasn't quite the same scene, but my dad was making sure I was careful not to, you know, there could be some shot, there would be some yeah. shot in there. So who knows? Yeah. 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 I remember those things. It's funny. The things you do remember, you know, when you're quite young, I do remember at that age too, there I was four. My mother was already taking me to the, to see movies at that age, you know, big movie theaters and yeah. in Argentina and in, in Buenos Aires. And uh, that was sort of a golden age that started in the 20s, 30s. And there was this one street in the center of, of the city called uh, La Valle. And that there was like, tw there was about 20 big cinemas there. I mean, big, big, like over a thousand seats. There was a couple that had 2000 or more seats and they were grand old movie palaces you know and I mean, she would take me a lot which seemed normal at the time you know i mean anything that your parents do seems you accept it because you don't know anything else but 
she would take me to see, I mean, like movies for adults, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago. I, I was four, I would have been f four when I saw Lawrence of Arabia with her, which is the first one I really remember the whole movie and the experience and how she talked about it. Yeah. So when obviously that's, that was, that leads on nicely actually to like you becoming an actor, what, like that was that the influence but how how that was i'd say it probably was the influence by the sound of it but how did you how did you then choose and what was your route into into acting um i never i mean i fantasized about lots of things but mostly about being an explorer or a viking or a gaucho or something like that but um you know adventures rescues you know things like that and um camping out i loved camping out and um, I, it would have never occurred to me to perform in front of people. I mean, the only thing I did in my, as a schoolboy, I remember I was in a play when I was like seven. It was a play about St. George killing the dragon. Yeah. And, and I was two boys, another boy and myself were the dragon. We had this sort of gray cloth over and a head. And I was the ass end of the dragon. So I had to be like, behind the boy in there and our our two legs each our four legs were you know the dragon with yeah, gray socks yeah. stockings on i think and we just had to roar basically um so that was not a big deal but i would have never imagined actually performing so that came to it late what i always did like from the very start though was movie stories and my mom which seemed normal at the time talked about story all the time she wasn't she would ask me what I thought about things that weren't shown, things that were shown, or what do you think is going to happen next? If it was, say, Lawrence of Arabia in the intermission, I remember her talking. She seemed very concerned that the British at that point in the story were not, were going to somehow betray Lawrence or, you know, they weren't, the British army wasn't really going to help him and his Arab friends. She said something like that. And I, yeah, I was yeah. just thinking about the camels, really. I remember being very, because compared to riding a horse, that looked complicated. And I was thinking about that. And I said to her something like, you know, well, I think that Lawrence and his friends, they know a lot more about camel riding and, you know, the desert. So I think they'll be all right, mom, you know. And, and, and so, and that is true, you know, for a while they were much, I mean, they were better at all that. So that was my focus, but, but she was talking about story and she always did. You know, even as an adult, when I would say, Mom, let's go to the movies, you know, then it would be me taking her. Yeah. And shortly before I just before I when I just started thinking it would be fun to try acting, I was I remember seeing it was around. Hmm. Well, I thought about it, but I didn't do anything about it. This would have been late 70s. I remember seeing the deer hunter movies like that with her. Yeah. Um, and but it wasn't until 19. 82 or so that I really and I was already almost yeah I was already 24 years old or so I mean I didn't I didn't really try it I was like, how do you do that and and I moved to New York City yeah um moved to be with a you know woman I was going out with at the time and then when I was there I was like well, what am I gonna do here I, I wanted to write and, you know, which I was doing, writing poems and short stories. But <clears throat> then I thought I'd like to try this acting thing. And since I don't know anybody here, anybody here, if it goes badly, you know, fuck it, doesn't matter. And I remember looking in the yellow pages in the phone book, you know, for like a place that you could try out for a play. I had no idea. And so I called this one place. It was called the Warren Robertson Theater Workshop. And he, t as it turned out, he was a great teacher. And he was sort of actor studio type approach to teaching acting but I thought it was a theater so I called up and I said what's the play what, what do you mean what's the play what do you what's the next play you guys are doing I said uh, would you like to audition and I said well yeah I mean try out and they go yeah that's what audition yeah I said okay and come down at Wednesday you know 8 30 p.m and bring two pieces and I said two pieces of what two memorized texts that you can recite and I said that's it how long should they be no more than a couple minutes or something like that each and I said okay so I didn't know what the hell that meant so I found there was at the time I was reading a collection of short stories by Karen Blixen Isaac Dinesen 
And there was one where she's, there's a character, one of the characters is Jack the Ripper. And so I took all the bits of dialogue from the character and I cobbled them together and made a monologue where this guy is yeah. Yeah, expressing himself and, uh, and added some bits to it. And then, and then I don't know why I did this either, but then, then I got a, a song. There's an old Irish song. What was it called? Um, Arthur McBride, you know that song? No, I don't. One morning as me and me cousin, one Arthur McBride went to walk in down by the seaside. And it's about this guy is, they're confronted by the English army and they're recruited and they're threatened. Well, they'll be killed if they don't join up or something. So they're forced into service for the mil for the British army. And so I read this Jack the Ripper thing, must have been very strange in their eyes, you know, and ears. And then I sang this song and there was silence. And then I, and then I, they didn't say anything. And they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll take this under consideration and we'll get back to you. And I said, so what's the play? And they said, there is no play. This is a theater workshop. I said, oh, I had no idea what that meant. And so then I did get a call and they said I was accepted and I could come back. And so it was a scene study class basically and acting exercises. And so that's where I started. Yeah, that's, um, that's unbelievable. Like, I, I love the fact that you didn't know anything about it. It was just a prop complete bit of a off the cuff. Yeah, let's see what comes here. I mean, I just wanted to be in a play. And I thought, you know. But then what, what, so when did, where did that go? Like, what was the next, what was the bit of paid work after that? Can you remember? Um, well, yeah, you have to get lucky, you know, too. But, uh, but you need to prepare for your luck. I mean, you just can't, it lands in your lap. You have to recognize it. But I started going to these acting classes and enjoyed it. And they paired you up with people and you had to prepare. They said, well, you're going to do this scene and this is your acting partner. Okay. And then you go to each other's apartments or whatever and work on it. And um, so I started doing that and we presented the scene and then it would be criticized and then you'd have to bring it back again the next week or something. And somebody, I guess it was a friend, of, it was somebody related to the instructor came in, it was an agent or something, and saw me and then I think the teacher actually saw some promise. I mean, it was, I was pretty unorthodox probably in the way I did think that he kept having, I was gesticulating too much, I think. I remember that. And he said, he made me do the scene the next time I had to sit on my hands and play the whole scene and not walk around and not wave my arms about. And so I had to act and he said, stop jutting your head forward. Just sit still and play the scene sitting down. Yeah, but she's walking around. Yes, because she can do it like a, you know, in a way that's not out of control. You know, so it was kind of that. But whatever that energy was, he thought there was something there. So he sent me to, actually, he sent me to an agent, a casting agent. Uh, recommend. He said, ah, oh, this kid's got something or something, you know, that sort of thing. And then I started being sent out on auditions. She introduced me to an agent who would send me on auditions. And, yeah. and I started trying out and I, I got, I did well, well enough to be, end up being doing lots of auditions and getting, you know, for leading roles in movies and things. And I would get always down to the last two, me and someone else, including twice in that first spring, first year. Uh, I was went to England twice. I went to London and I got down to, it was between me and Christopher Lambert for Greystoke, the part of Tarzan. Yeah, yeah I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> and then another one was another, uh, it was a movie, it was some, some kind of horror movie. Um, there was an actor from New York that I was always, you know, you'd run into the same actors your age at different auditions. And this guy's name was Jelko Ivanek. American actor, really good theater actor. And uh, and he was, it was between him and me for that part. I didn't get either one. And I would run into Joko a lot at different auditions. And years later, I ran into not him, but another actor who was also in that group that would always be trying out for the same parts. And they said to me, this was like 20 years later, they said, you used to do that terrible thing to try to psych us out. I said, what are you talking about? Well, you would pretend you were sleeping. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, we'd be sitting in the waiting room and you'd like be snoring away. 
I said, oh, that's just a nervous reaction. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, I used to, because I'd be nervous sitting with all these actors, so I would just doze off and that would be a way to calm down. And then they would say, your turn. I'm oh, okay, I'm going. Which is probably part of the reason I wasn't getting these roles in the end because they probably thought it was, I was just half asleep. But um, yeah, so I, I did that a lot. I mean, over those first two, three years, I probably got down to the last two for movie auditions and movie and TV movies also probably a couple dozen times, 25 times maybe. Never got the role, but you learn something. Each time you learn how to prepare a role and different casting directors talk to you differently, different directors. And you start to get familiar with how to act and not be worried about the camera, to use it, but not seem aware of it, all that. It's just technique, practice, you know, so. And in that sense, I kept, I was preparing myself and I kept studying as well and started getting small parts and just building it up that way. It was probably good for me, you know, being sort of a late bloomer and a slow learner that I could sort of build up some work bit parts here and there, TV, plays, small parts of movies over the years, and working on other jobs because I couldn't pay the rent, you know, bartender, moving furniture, whatever, lots of jobs. And uh, even sold ice cream for a short period on the street, you know, as you do. And um, But it was probably good that I didn't get one of those big roles right away because it might have stunted, I might not have been able to sort of in relative or complete anonymity, watch how people did things and how people behaved on sets with nobody yeah. paying any attention whatsoever and no expectation that I would go to any premiere or anything. I mean, I, when I finally did get, I, did, I got two speaking parts with really good directors. One was Jonathan Demi and another was Woody Allen. Yeah. A movie called Swing Shift and a movie called The Purple Rose of Cairo. And each time I was out of them, but since nobody paid any attention, it wasn't a big part. I wasn't informed. You know, I told my whole family I wasn't going to be in the movie that's coming out next Friday. And of course I wasn't. The second time it happened, my mom said, what the hell are you doing down there in New York? I said, well, I got a job and I'm working, you know, but I'm trying to get work as an actor. And I was in that movie. They, they just cut it out. What do you mean they cut it out? Well, they didn't use the scene. Well, you know, what can I tell you? It's not my decision whatever she was always very interested and she always wanted to know about the director and if she knew about the director she'd tell me well you know he did that movie and he did that and yeah i know mom. <laughs> or maybe i didn't and she would inform me it was amazing i had a great experience with her when she already had dementia and she was you know late in her life mm. it was the first time that i was really sort of nominated for any awards which i just like trying to get a part and not getting it. It took, it's taken me, it continues to take me. I get nominated quite a bit sometimes, but I, I don't win. And, um, and it was for Eastern Promises. And I remember, I think it was the Screen Actors Guild Award. And I said, mom, come on down. She was living near my brother in the Northwest of the United States. And she came to Los Angeles and we went to this event, red carpet. And I said, okay, you can go with this lady and wait for me, I have to go there. She goes, no, I'll go with you. I said, no, I have to do these interviews. It's probably, but it would have been great actually if she'd done it because she probably knew more about movies than they did. But um, so I did my interviews and she was watching and once in a while she, I'd look over and she'd be like, and then we went into the building and it was like tables, you know, that kind of event, dinner. Yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of was sort of like the Golden Globes are, you know, not like the Oscars where you're all sitting like in, 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 in uh, theater seats. But uh, and so we're sitting there and she was constantly noticing people, especially the older directors and actors. She'd say, I know who that is. You know, he was in and she would name the year and the movie and what it was about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen that one. Is that who that is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or she's that's John Travolta. And I go, certainly is. And then she'd get up and she'd walk over to the table and sit down with him, you know. I start talking and point over there, eh, that's my son. <laughs> and so she kept doing that. Anybody she recognized, she'd just get up and walk over. It was wonderful, um, but embarrassing a little bit. And um, so she did, her plate was taken away. She came back, she said, where's my dinner? I said, well, you've been like, you know, you know, uh, being a social butterfly, you missed dinner, mom. What can I say? It's gone. <laughs> and, she's, and she said, oh, that's not fair. <clears throat> and I said, no, but she enjoyed that a lot. And at the end, I did ask for them if there was a plate 
And as everybody was leaving, you know, um, I stayed with her there and the place was emptying out. It was kind of an interesting environment. And I remember someone I'd worked with, uh, Diane Lane came walking by. She was on her way out and she came home. She goes, hi, how are you? I hadn't seen her for a few years. We'd worked on a movie called A Walk on the Moon. And she says, you're Diane Lane. And she's eating her chicken or whatever. And she says, yes, I am. Yes, you did. A, you were very good in that movie with my son. And so then she offered some, you know, unsolicited criticism of the movie. I don't know what she said. Not too bad, but, you know, they could have done this or that. And I said, do you want to... I think she sat down for a moment, but then she had some, she was there with someone. So they left and we finished and it was a great experience. I wish I'd been able, I wish I'd been, I suppose, nominated earlier so I could have taken to those things. I didn't, of course she enjoyed it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's a, the, I mean, t I mean, I was going to come to it a bit later, but like dementia plays a, a, a big role in, in falling. Yeah. Um, I found it I found it mega moving and sad as well. My, like my grandmother had dementia and obviously, you know, no longer is with us because of because of that reason. And she was like a I suppose like your mother, she was like a mega switched on person. So switched on, did did so much for the community, was an amazing cook, all those sort of things. It was like the like the head of everything whenever the families came together and it was, I found it difficult. I found it really difficult. It was, was she the family historian? Was she the one you'd go to if you wanted to say, now who was related to who? And yeah, that? yeah, exactly. So, so she grew up down in the Southwest of England and, and like grew up on a farm and, mm. you know, just amazing. And she could talk to you about who I was related to and where they came from and the family tree. And, you know, pirates were part of the family back in you're like, oh, wow, that's awesome when you're a kid. That was my mom. She was the one who knew all that. But then to see it, I don't know, disappear, but there was certain things that brought them back. And it's like, that was interesting to listen to you there about your mum being at, at the the awards. And it, it was something that obviously reconnected her yeah. with, is that, is that why Willis, you know, Lance's character had, that was where you got that from, do you think? Well, I mean, it's not just my mom. I've had a lot of experience up close with dementia. My mother, my father, my stepfather, I mean, very up close and even at times in a caregiving capacity. Yeah. But also early, I mean, much earlier than that, my grandfather in Denmark. Uh, I mean, really three of my four grandparents had it to one degree or another. Um, the strongest first impression was from my grandfather in Denmark. I remember that was really intense. And um, my father was very, he didn't know how to deal with that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, said to me, I was, I would have been 17, 18, maybe. We had a sort of a very uncomfortable lunch where the whole family, aunts and uncles and everybody were there. And, and my grandfather, for some reason, thought I was my father and didn't know who my father was and was vociferous about it. And it was like really un uncomfortable, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Sort of funny in retrospect, some of the things he said, but I didn't know how to deal with it. I was just, you know, like he thought, he was whispering, but in that way where you whisper where the whole table can hear you, like not too quietly. And he was like, yeah. that man, who is he? You know? And I said, oh, it's my dad. No, it's not. I mean, he's, he wants to steal my tools, you know, go out in the shed and make sure that he hasn't taken my Allen rancher. I don't know what the hell he was talking about. And, um, and I looked around and nobody seemed to know what to do. And I said, I got up and I went outside as if to go. I did, I walked to the shed and I, and I walked back and I sat down and he said, so? And I said, They're all, all your tools seem to be in place. Okay, well, keep an eye on him, you know, like that kind of thing. And so when we're driving home, my dad said, let me know if that even begins to happen to me. Make sure you give me fair warning. Mm. And I said, okay, so I can shoot myself, you know? And I'm like, and I thought to myself at that time, it's like, well, I don't know if I'm gonna tell him that if he's gonna do that, you know what? <laughs> yeah. And then of course, when my father got it, I didn't, <laughs> you didn't tell him that or so he could shoot himself, not that he would have understood any, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. life is different than what you think it's gonna be always. And yeah, so I had a lot of experience with, with dementia up close and and that informed how I wrote Willis and, and his relationship to his children, to John yeah. and Sarah.
and the rest of the family. And uh, one thing I wanted to do, and I think we did manage to do that with the help of Lance's really fine, beautiful acting, uh, brave acting, really. And what you can do with film, I mean, it's, it's such a great medium, you know, in terms of what you can do with image, images and sound, placement of sound, mix of sound, yeah. quality of sound and image. Um, which was I wanted to not show someone who, which is the way people who have dementia or Alzheimer's in movies or plays are usually shown. They're shown as someone who's confused, basically. And if they, and if, if an attempt is made to show their point of view, it's of a confused person, a confused point of view, generally. And my experience, my personal experience over and over again is that it's the observers who tend to be confused, not mm. the person, unless they're corrected, unless, you know, yeah. Say your father says to you, oh, I just had lunch with Jimmy this morning. He's put on some weight and you're thinking Jimmy died 35 years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, you, your instinct is to say, well, dad, no, Jimmy's long gone. I mean, he's died years ago. And what happens when you do that, then they do get confused and they can get very upset because that person dies for them again. And if they're still in the beginning stages and they come in and out of the dementia and they realize what they've said in any way they feel really stupid so it's it's kind of a selfish thing you think you're helping it's instinctive you think it's a, but it's not the right thing no, what no. you have to do is adapt to you're not going to get your dad back the way he was no so what's good for them now yeah how do you communicate so you, yeah so you have to you know like any relationship first to get along with someone and have some kind of connection you have to accept what's in front of you and you have to accept how you are in front of that and so, you know, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, you can say, what did you and Jimmy have for lunch? You know, and uh, then they'll tell you a story about that maybe, or, you know, I mean, you just have to be flexible and unselfish, but your instinct is to want to fix them. Mm. Which know? is going to happen. But then I suppose if, if people are able to put themselves or, or attempt to put themselves in someone's shoes going through that, would you want to keep reliving? If you think someone's alive, do you want to keep reliving the grief from that? You don't, you don't want to do that. Of no one does. Not. So of course good, not. It's good that you, you know, bring these things to the forefront of people's minds because I think I hope a lot of people get something from it, as I'm sure you do. With regards yeah, to yeah, I do. You know, I mean, it's not quite a story. You don't have moments like that. You know, I mean, there was I had there's, there's lots of things that are actually kind of funny. You know, my dad, I remember him one time being very worried about the old people being left out in the snow at the station. And I finally figured out he was talking about something that would have happened in the in not long after World War Two. And it was some relatives in Denmark at a station that in a town where there's no longer a train station even. Yeah. And they had to go be picked up because they were standing in the snow waiting to be picked up. And I think in a wagon with the horse. And uh, and so I said, OK, I'll be right back. And I went out in the kitchen and made myself a cup of tea and came back a few minutes later thinking, well, he's either going to remember that train of thought or he's not. And so I walked in and he said, so what happened? So I said, um, I picked him up. But they're really tired. And they said, they're sorry, but they're so tired. They just went to bed. You know, I made him a sandwich. They went to bed and they said that uh, they'll see you in the morning for breakfast. And he said, good, you know, and what you're doing there, you're having to give up your illusions of them being what they were. That's really about you and your yeah. ego and your needs. It's not really about them. So what did I do for him? I, I made it be OK and made him feel like he was involved in a solution in some way and all was well. So. That's for him. That's where you got to. I mean, ideally, we should always serve other people, shouldn't we? Yeah, 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 agree. <laughs> you know, especially if we care about them. But there it really comes into focus. It's no longer a question of, well, should I or shouldn't I? It's like there is only one good way to deal with the situation, which is make them comfortable. Don't correct them. You almost mm -hmm. never have to. Why would you? He, he goes to bed happy as well, you know. Right. And he That's may or may not remember the next day and... And then if he they, he does, you deal with it, or you say, you know, we had breakfast with them, remember? And, and then they said they went shot, they were going shopping. Oh, yeah. right, okay. You know. Or if they're, you know, who knows? I mean, you just have to think on your feet. Yeah, exactly, and yeah. develop it, develop the story for them, so it was, it's all good. 
And you're, and it's sad in a way because you're feeling like, God, I'm making up this thing. It's not real. It's, it's. I don't have my dad anymore the way he was. But it's completely real to them. And so yeah, what no. I was trying to do with Willis was to show that his present is quite different than ours. But if we say that memory is subjective anyway and unreliable, why should his present, very real to him, what he's seeing and feeling and imagining, um, why is that any less valid than ours? <laughs> exactly, because when you think about our memories, they are, are they are they real? You know, I talk to friends about stuff that I was involved with with them, and my perception of what that event was like was completely different to them, right? and they were still five foot away from me. And they're like, no, it was nighttime. It wasn't, there was summer, yeah. not winter, or, yeah. or you weren't even there. Yes, I was. <laughs> no, I told you about it afterwards. You yeah. sure I wasn't there? No, you were there another time, but not when that happened, you know? Yeah, yeah. And we're convinced otherwise, right? And ultimately, it's just, it's your story, which means the people that have got dementia have got their story. It's just, it's just different, yeah. Exactly. Or we think it's different. It's probably- You just you know, feel like you're being robbed of some reality that you want to believe in. Yeah. They're not there with you anymore. We've go, Going back to um, Willis and Lance, obviously Lance is, the, the the actor he is and he's been in some a lot of stuff that i've enjoyed but his well, life story is unbelievable i mean here's a guy who's 80 years old he's probably done two almost 280 movies many of which he probably hasn't even seen he just likes to work i mean he always does a good job no matter how strange the movie is he's always believable and that's why i wanted him to do this part but here he just he shows you what he could could always have done maybe you know and and it's so great that he uh, that he gets to shine in this way you know is it, i mean his performance everyone's performance is brilliant but his he's obviously that he is a standalone character in it because of yeah. what he's trying to portray but how what was that journey like with you and him developing the character of willis because i mean like you said earlier it is a brave performance because yeah you, you can see that he puts himself out there well, I, he came on early and we started working on the script and the character and talking a lot. And I got to know him, you know, got to, I mean, I had met him on the shoot of Appaloosa in 2007. The movie came out in 2008. It was a Western that Ed Harris directed, uh, Appaloosa. And um, so I got to know him a little bit and I liked him. I hadn't written Falling at the time. But then when I finished the script, I thought he'd be great. Hope he wants to do it. I, he's never done this really, but... He might, he'd be great, I think. He'd do something special. Fortunately, he wanted to do it. But then I kept losing the money and not finding, you know, the things that happen with independent filmmaking. And it took a couple goes, you know, a few years. And But he always stuck with it. And I remember when I finally said, okay, we're going to just, I'm going to just start filming this spring, summer images. And we're going to do it. Are you still willing to play the part? And he paused. He went, um, yeah, okay. Yes. And I said, well, if you don't want to do it, it's okay. But what happened? And he goes, no, I'm just thinking about it. It's going to be difficult. And I said, well, yeah, you know, it's a big challenge, not just because the role and the, so much text and emotional complications and I'm not worried about, I mean, I am worried about that because I've not done that really, but I've never done a part like that, but I'm really emotionally, I'm going to have to go to some places to be honest. I don't want to be caught acting. You know, that's my philosophy. And I said, yeah. And then he started telling me what he was going to have to revisit, which was his childhood and how his parents were, which was horrible. I mean, it was just unbelievable the things he told me, these stories. But he said he would tell me just these horrible, like almost like Oliver Twist kind of, but much worse <laughs> stories. And uh, just growing up on the streets and being illiterate until he was 30. Um, but laughing sometimes, kind of calmly. And I said, well, it's amazing. You're so accepting of all that. And he said, oh, it took me decades, you know, but I finally realized I went through that shit. Why do I want to keep living in it? So I'm moving past it and I want to just accept it as it was, but I am going to have to explore that, those feelings again. So that's, what's going to be hard. I said, I understood. And so that's why I say brave among other reasons, but it's because he really did go there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is awesome. I, I've literally watched it. To, I got the link last night and I watched it today and it was, it was brilliant. I really, 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 really think it was brilliant. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, his life story, it's not just, it's like once in a while someone does 
an extraordinary gives an extraordinary performance as he has in the mm. role of Willis. That alone is just memorable, I think, and will stand the test of time. But that combined with what his life story is and his actual moment in his life, so late getting a role like that and showing us what he could yeah. do. That's extraordinary, I think, in itself. I mean, it's, that is a story, <laughs> just him, what he's done and the fact that he did it with this role. And I mean, that's why I say it's a shame you couldn't talk to him today, but um, he's a remarkable person and he did a remarkable job. No, it was, yeah, really good. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, I found it quite hard, as in, in a good way, if you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was no, it's. I know some audiences are like, Ugh, some people are bound to, maybe if they're younger and haven't dealt with older people or I don't know, might be less tolerant of like, oh, Jesus, do I have to listen to this over and over? But that's what happens. People yeah. become repetitive and what they are is what they are. And yeah. when dementia comes on, it's even worse. And, and so, and it was also intentional in terms of the story structure and the way these men are, father and son, you know, it's a story sort of told through the, from the son's point of view mostly, but it's a lot of the memories are from Willis's point of view. And the idea is it wasn't the usual conflict that's at the center of a drama where there's two people battling. It's one peaceful, one person attacking, the other person sort of backing up and just, you know, forcing themselves to not react and fight back because over the years he's learned that that's not going to work and now this guy needs help and i have to accept i have to listen to a lot of shit if i'm going to help him until he can't at some point so it's like a bow that you're pulling back 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 and the tension yes. is coming from that unusual kind of non-conflict in a way until either the bow is going to break or you're going to let go of the string and then something's going to happen and that's that was the idea you know no, was, yeah, awesome. Um, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to start to start slowly wrap it up. I'm going to step. We're going to go back to you a little bit, Vigo, and just because some people will want to hear about it. 2001 to 2003, there was the trilogy, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. Touching back on your career, do you, do you think that that was a turning point? Did that change things for you? Because it was, oh, yeah. it was, it was a huge thing that you know, Peter Jackson. You know. Yes, it was. I mean, of course it was. I mean, for me and everybody else involved, especially yeah. the actors, uh, but some of the crew members too started getting more work. Plus they had learned so much in that long shoot. But uh, yeah, I mean, not only did it open the doors, obviously I got to work with David Cronenberg on History of Violence, a role I wouldn't have been cast in had it not been for the success of Lord of the Rings. I mean, that put us sort of on the map suddenly that unexpected global success of that trilogy. But the main thing I got out of that, which was changed, a big change for me, which was watching that kind of filmmaking, that kind of ingenuity on the part of Peter Jackson leading yeah. his team, how there was no problem they couldn't solve. You know, it was, in part, it was like that sort of Kiwi making do, we can yeah. do it. We, we, we're an island nation, we're used to handling, you know, they say, uh, we'll use some number eight eight wire you, yeah. with that you can fix any engine anything you know there's that sort of philosophy well we can do it you know one job at a time and each job is success we'll just do it and they would invent new ways to film things they were just little problems and big problems every day month after month after month watching how he and his team would solve problems which is what movie making well life is about that too but movie making is certainly about solving a series of problems and obstacles yeah. each day and he had big ones a lot of times and little ones and he it was just remarkable it was an incredible once in a lifetime film school for me and everybody who was paying attention and I watched a crew of hundreds of mostly New Zealanders but you know Australians English Americans yeah. but mostly New Zealanders and a lot you know there hadn't been a huge film industry before that there you know there had been films made by some good filmmakers here and there, but um, um, like Jeff Murphy was one of the many directors directing Second Unit. He had done, you know, uh, some really good movies and, you know, they all, any decent New Zealand director was on there just shooting Second Unit. It was just like yeah. a constant circus of activity and units shooting at the same time. But otherwise it was a crew, crew a big crew of young people mostly who had had very little experience, maybe some TV shootings, a little bit of movie work, 
And by the end of that experience, they were veterans. Yeah. And they were ready for what was to come in New Zealand, which was a lot of movies coming in from, from England, from the US yeah. and other places. And suddenly there was, you know, Peter Jackson single-handedly created this massive film industry there in a way. And it was great to be part of that. Did you learn from did you learn from that experience those learnings from that experience? You obviously took forward to falling, do you think? Or, yeah. Or, well learned, like, you learned a lot yeah. more of the way, but was that the beginning? Yes, from Peter from Peter Jackson and that experience a lot. That sort of the collective approach to filmmaking, you know, was important. Yeah. But also from him and from especially David Cronenberg, but Jane Campion, French directors that I've worked with, Argentina, I mean all kinds of directors. The one thing no matter how different their style might be or how they are as people the two things that were really significant that i've learned over the years and certainly on on, on peter jackson's you know from peter jackson as well was that there's you can never prepare too much or too early for a shoot i mean preparation is everything you can minimize the amount of errors and misunderstandings by just really preparing thoroughly. And the other thing is to always keep the door open. You know, a good idea can come from anyone at any time. So make it clear, say that. Yeah. Which I did on the first day of shooting and falling. I said, what I've learned is that a good idea can come from any one of you at any time. So don't tell me your good idea tomorrow when we've already shot today's scene. Yeah, say yeah. it in the moment. I'll never be offended or feel like you're usurping my authority or my control over this story that I've made up and want to shoot i am yeah. prepared i know what i want to do but it can always be improved yeah oh so i want to make this movie together with all of you and that's what we did and i that that those are the things i learned from from people that's like awesome. peter jackson yeah. yeah that's how you run a team everyone listening. yeah 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 i mean <laughs> okay. it's always gonna be better you know you might not agree all the time but together you can make it better yeah it's worth listening what I'm going to do, and we always do, is finish on a reader's question, so we put it out there into the... Sure. Yeah. Uh, this one brings it back to the to falling, because obviously that's what it's all about. And this one's from uh, the Nighthawk Room. Was there anything vulnerable about using, you know, your own life in parts as a kind of template for falling? And how did it feel to rap on, on a movie that, you know, you've invested so much in writing, directing, acting in, you know... What was that? What was that like? Okay. Um, well, it was I, in a way. I mean, I wrote, started writing "Falling" first as a short story and later as a script because I thought, well, it's quite visual. Maybe it's a movie story. Um, right after my mother's funeral, where all these, as happens when someone dies that you care about and are close to, uh, you remember many things. Images flash by over the years, you know, from childhood to now about this person and, and you hear stories at the funeral from people some of the stories are similar but they're different versions like we've talked about it's like it's interesting that's not how i was told it but whatever and new stories and new people maybe some old people that were childhood friends oh i knew your mom i went to school with your mom you know and this happened and that and and so you get different takes on this person and so i wanted to write these things down before i forgot and then i looked at all this assembly of notes and imagery and that was described in these stories and stuff and uh yeah, this is pretty interesting structurally as a story so i started writing that and in a way writing the screenplay even though it became a fiction i felt freer making up this family but using feelings i had and some memories like the duck sequence yeah. some fragments of conversation even some of this dementia stuff later on but mostly things, feelings from my childhood and adolescence. Writing it, preparing it, shooting it, editing it, it all was a continuation. It was like keeping those, not really wounds open, mm -hmm. but keeping that awareness and those memories alive, even as they evolved, because I was now fictionalizing. I started to look, I would look at the actress, Hannah Groves, who's so good playing Gwen, the mother figure, yeah. which even though she's not the central character, for me, she is, emotionally the central character because she's the conscience of the story like that's what she, yeah. the father and son and the father and daughter often are arguing about the memory of her and how they feel about her and she i would just there was be uncanny things that she would do and i was like wow that's so much like my mother or it feels like it you know even lance with some moments of 
you know, the sort of in and out of mental states and dementia, like, wow. I mean, I didn't even say anything, but it was, that's great. It's so similar. And is it or isn't it? Maybe it's all blurring, you know, but it was kind of a continuation. And so I've kept that going. And that I liked, it was a vulnerable thing sometimes, but one thing that was unexpected and really a gift was that the crew from the first day, they started coming up and saying, oh, this reminds me of my uncle or yeah, my grandmother, this and that. And they would tell me stories, like almost confessions sometimes, and sometimes quite emotional. And they would be moved. You would see sometimes crew members in certain intense scenes, they would be crying somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then it became sort of normal and wonderful. It was like, so there was, I thought, wow, there's a universal application of this, what we're telling together, this fiction. So I better not ruin it in the editing room. You know, I want that to happen with audiences, which it has. I've had those kinds of reactions from people, which is great. Like you even mentioned someone in your family, you know, so yeah, yeah. that happened. That's great. And um, yeah, when it's a collective effort, it's always a big moment when you, I remember when we shot our last shot, it was in, uh, it was in the Thai restaurant, I remember. And they gave me the, the slate from it, which I have, you know, where it says scene, whatever, take, you know, yeah. the name of the cinematographer and my name and the name of the movie. I kept that. And uh, so it was, it was a really, it was a relief to have all this uh, material, but I was thinking, I can't wait to get it in the editing room. For me, it didn't really end. So it wasn't a full letting go. Uh, then it was a long period editing here in London and sound mixing and score and all that stuff. So, and then it was trying to get it out there. It was the first time was when I first saw it with the, the whole crew showed them the movie. That was where I suddenly thought, okay, now it's out of my hands now. And it's, it's wonderful. And it was very emotional that that was, it was beautiful. And I liked that idea. I liked the idea that the movie really becomes your movie, the viewer. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and that's what I liked as a kid with my mom watching movies. It's, I like the kind of stories where I'm not told everything, where there are things that I have to figure out for myself if I'm interested enough in what I'm seeing in the first 10 to 15 minutes so that I participate without even thinking about it in the storytelling. And by the end, I have my take on it. It's my movie, maybe more than the directors and that's the way it ought to be if, when it works you know so that's i've been really happy to have people say well i could see why you did this and this means that and i'm like fuck i never thought of that but yeah it could be why not you know that's wonderful they care enough to say that rather than uh i, I you lost me halfway through you know or something no they're they're having their own opinions about what the story is i think that's great that's what it's all about, isn't it? So it didn't end when we finished shooting. It ended, it's still ending. I mean, it's like each time I talk with an audience, like I did yesterday, like I'm going to do tonight, Yeah. I get different. It's like I, and when I watch a movie with a different audi audience, it's it's a different movie because I can yeah. feel there's a different reaction to certain moments. I'm like, oh, I didn't expect someone to laugh there. Or, an, aud an audience is individuals, isn't it? And they've all got their own take on everything that they is put in front of them. Yeah, they bring their life experience to relate to what they're seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of our chat, Vigo. Unfortunately, we could have spoken, or I could have spoken for ages, or listened to you for ages. Me anyway. too. I would have loved to, to speak longer with yeah. you. Yeah. But um, thank you so much. Falling, it's there. I urge people to watch it because it's an, an amazing journey, and it, I found it emotional in a good way. And it was, you know, I had my own bits that, fed into it because of my memories. So 100% awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you're, you know, for the people in the UK, if you're in a city or a region where you can, where cinemas are open and it's showing, if you can see it, if, you know, wear a mask, it's safe. You know, I've been going to the movies a lot yeah. since the lockdown ended uh, where I live. And uh, if you can see it on the screen, it's a, you know, it's a better experience always. And if you can't, I know that Curzon and other cinemas are doing it where you can buy your ticket essentially and you get the streaming experience which is better than not seeing it at all so however you can i hope you'll you'll want to see it and see especially to see yeah. some of the really interesting performances above all lance henriksen who has a powerhouse performance yeah awesome okay vigo thank you you too take care thanks very much to vigo hope you enjoyed that as much as i did Falling is out now in cinemas and available to watch at home via modernfilms.com. 
If you go to the Book of Man screening room on that site, they are giving 50% of the ticket price to the Alzheimer's Society. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow me and the Book of Man for the latest news. Thanks again to Talisker for supporting this podcast. And thanks to you all for listening. Take it easy and I'll see you soon.